So, the next talk, I'm just fired up here, you can get wired up, is um, Doug Kelly. And uh, just start out by saying that, you know, part of successfully getting a big project off the ground is knowing when you need help. And uh, that was exactly our position uh, when we gotten ourselves into after we found we got this ONDCP grant. So at MGH, you don't really take anything seriously until like the NOGA comes in, right? You know, we talk about big magnets, we talk about projects and grants, but then suddenly, you know, the, the check hits the account and it's like, oh no, you know, now we have to do it. And uh, that was the position we found ourselves in relatively quickly because the process happened fast. It was not like an NIH grant. And uh, so we didn't even know at that time whether we were gonna partner with GE or Siemens. All we knew for sure was we wanted a, a clinical uh, MR partner, a clinical console on the thing, not a Varian or Brooker, which was what all of the ultra high field projects to date have done. And Doug had played a really integral role in the ANMR 3T and then the GE 3T product. And those were two very important instruments to the NMR Center's history. And so I was very personally thankful uh, that Doug could come on and help uh, guide this new project into existence. And we were really kind of lucky in our timing. He'd just come back from Australia. And uh, when he signed on, maybe he was still disorientated from being on the upside down down there. Uh, anyway, he was uh, we thankfully joined our project and we played an integral role in, in getting going. And then since then, he's gone on to be the global 7T product manager at GE uh, for some time now, right? Like more than a decade and uh, the development of 7T applications at UCSF. And so without further ado, Doug. Thank you and uh, you, thank you to Larry and John for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, lessons learned and unlearned over the course of, uh, over the course of the past uh, 20 years. Um, so, so what did we, we think we knew about 70 in, in 1999. What do we know now and uh, what are we hoping to do uh, in the future? Well, we knew that magnets were really big and they needed a lot of shielding and a lot of helium. Uh, we knew that the gradients were the key to getting performance out of the system. We were pretty sure that diffusion was gonna be hard. Uh, we thought that B1 homogeneity would really limit a lot of the applications that we wanted to do. Uh, we knew that we should just focus on the brain to keep it simple, and uh, uh, that one has uh, remained true. Um, the SNR gains would help a bit with spatial resolution, but the real benefits we thought would be in uh, bold and spectroscopy. And the clinical, the clinical applications for 7T were really a, a good ways off. Um, so with that in hand, we, oh, we started with the magnet. And yes, it was really, really big. This is about uh, 3.4 meters long. Each of the main magnet formers that um, you can see here, each of those weighs about six or seven tons. Uh, they've got about 100 kilometers of wire on each one. And they have to be aligned with a radial accuracy of about a millimeter. So uh, <laughs> this took a lot of careful thought and a lot of effort. Um, so the magnet itself is, is basically built up as a compensated solenoid. So these are just, just big cylindrical loops of wire. And then you add this on the outside to correct, to correct for the length. And these windings and these windings are there to correct the, uh, the Z2. Uh, variation that you get by cutting off the solenoid. And they really want to be in the middle. And the force is over a million kilograms. This is really, you know, this is really high end engineering. And being able to manage this is, uh, you know, is a big challenge. Um, so uh, <laughs> the overall magnet weight's about uh, 33 metric tons. And um, we'll talk a little bit later that the, um, this design hasn't, you know, uh, hasn't changed a whole lot, 
oh, well, we, well, what we've been able to add are some compensation coils on the outside of this, which really you know, just look like bigger versions of the Z2 coils. And what they're able to do is actively shield the magnet and make it much easier to sight. We don't, for example, need um, a 400 ton uh, 400 ton iron box in order to make everything work. Um, one thing we learned in the course of this design is that it was really important to get the middle of the magnet in the middle of the shield. Uh, the first installation of a 7T magnet like this was at the University of Minnesota and they tried to save some money by not burying the shield plates in the floor and what happened was that the magnet decided that it was going to be in the, in the middle of the shield room. Unfortunately, the cryostat was not. So they had, uh, had to do a lot of work rebuilding the suspension on site, and that, that slowed them down by about a year. Um, you know, we, were able to, we were able to learn from this, but it, it meant digging out a lot of uh, material from the floor, and over the course of... Uh, over the course of a year, uh, we got it done. We got the shield plates in, we got everything installed. And then <laughs> and finally in uh, mid to late 2000, the magnet showed up. Um, you know, we're able to lift it off the truck and bring it in through the middle of the building. But one thing you might wonder is really how you move something like this. And the answer is uh, you put it up on these wheels, on these rollers. And then you have a guy pull a cable very carefully. And you end up wrapping it around this big metal bar that you have to put across the front of the shield room. And when, you, when I say he's got to pull it carefully, he's got to pull it very carefully. Um, the magnet, in order to keep the mass of the, the shield room down, it has to be very compact around the magnet. And the clearance on the top was, uh, is about a centimeter and all of the the structures on top of the magnet had to be removed in order to get this in because the field is so strong that you have to put the cold heads up inside the shield otherwise the motors will seize up well we got it all done we got the system installed um, we're working with fronts we managed to get the patient table from trump and we got that uh, installed on the front uh, you know, looking very nice for a one-off research instrument. This was a 1.5T Avanto system cabinet. And then we added RF amplifier from CPC and some electronics that, that we, uh, uh, we built here. This is basically just a, a giant cable TV box that uh, it turns everything from the 1.5T that the system wanted up to the 7T that the spins wanted. Um, in order to get the magnet ramped, we also had to it, it get a hold of every 750 liter doer in New England. Uh, we had those for about a week. Uh, we managed to get the magnet filled and, uh, and ramped up and installed. Um, so my story then moved on to the NIH in, uh, in 2002. This is the first installation for GE. Uh, interestingly enough, the the first meeting I had with the NIH was to let them know that their magnet was going to be late by about a year. Uh, we, uh, uh, we got past that, and here's Helmut Merkel pointing the way to 7T. Uh, and the, the electronics, electronics room in, in Building 10 that was, has never been that empty ever again. Um, finally, towards the end of the year, we got the, uh, the magnet delivered. Um, brought it in through the, the side of the building into another 400 ton steel shield. And then a couple years later, uh, we got these images from the guys at the NIH. And these images are beautiful, but more important, the, there was a ton of detail and a ton of information in here. And, and this, I think, has is, is really been what's helped to feed the growth of 7T, that it, they're not just images that look a little bit better. They're images that have more information content. And it, figuring out how to leverage that and make use of that is, uh, I think, what's really it driven the growth of the field you know, over the last 20 years. Uh, a couple of years after that, 
we install the system at UCSF. So here's Dan Vigneron, Rich Kelly, who is the director of the center, and Sarah Nelson, who really put the whole project together. Um, we got the, the magnet delivered in late 2004, and uh, within about, I'd say about eight months, we got these images off of a volunteer. With, you know, with pretty good contrast and, and a lot of detail. Um, in doing a, a comparison with, with 3T, it's, it's, not just a, it's not just the SNR that, that is better. It's the, it's the information content. It's the detail in the image. You can see the, the optic radiations and the perforating vessels that are, maybe there's an indication at 3T, but it's just not quite there. And then uh, in a little more detail, yes, there's a you know, two-fold increase in SNR and going from 3T to 7T, but again, it's the, it's the information content that is, is so different. Um, the role of magnetic susceptibility in, in producing contrast in the image is, you know, is a central theme, it, you know, at least in the brain in particular, and it's the amazing level of anatomical detail that you can, can pull out. Um, it, this work for uh, Jeff Kirshner when he was at UCSF and then later uh, at Stanford, in, in, in isolating this one, this one subregion of the hippocampus, the stratum radiatum, and really showing that it is the, the neuronal loss that, you know, is, is a hallmark of uh, the development of Alzheimer's. Um, you know, explicitly looking at the face component to characterize these differences in MS lesions. Just looking at the magnitude, there's not a huge difference between these two. But here, it, it, if you look at the face, you can definitely pull out the, the ring in what is apparently a younger lesion. Um, in taking the phase information and, and converting it to a susceptibility map, um, you can see the prodromal Huntington's disease, the, the, the dramatic increase in the range of susceptibility variation within the, uh, within the thalamus and related structures. It's, if the information is there and trying to figure out what to do with it, I think will, will lead to further growth in the field. Okay, so what do we know now? We know that the good gradients can enable good diffusion at 7T. Good gradients at 7T are, are really good at 3T. Susceptibility contrast provides a lot of information that we can take active shielding and zero boil off, uh, and zero boil off cryostats and make them work at 7T as well. Improving the, uh, <laughs> improving the bio and homogeneity is, you know, it's hard. It takes a lot of work, but it's, it's not always essential. You can get good quality images with uh, some simple approaches. And that while well, well, 70 will likely play a role in <coughs> understanding brain disease and brain development, it's not the next 3T. Um, you, you know, there are or something close to 100 systems out in the field now. And I think that that number is likely to double, but it's not gonna grow much more than that, I don't think. So what can we see now? This is off of, uh, off of our latest generation system in our uh, uh, development bay in Wisconsin. Um, you know, MP Rage at 0.8 millimeter isotropic with a six minute scan time. This is, uh, as close to push button as close to push button as it's going to get, and you know, in, co in comparison, three T, you notice uh, the bright arteries. Well, that's because we're using a head coil as a transmitter, and we don't have the inflow, of, you know, inflow effect. Um, we can see that uh, well, we can see sharp venous structures due to susceptibility contrast, and in particular, if you push the echo time out a little bit more, those become more apparent. But you can get good definition of the cortical boundary and pretty uniform contrast around the brain with uh, a very light degree of uh, intensity normalization. Um, you know, we can get high resolution T2 images with the, the fast spin echo. And 
you can see some amazing details, particularly at the paravascular spaces, which um, may play a significant role in looking at glymphatic flow and uh, garbage collection mechanisms within the brain that may be the key to a, a range of neurodegenerative disorders. Um, Multi-echo, gradient echo, and it gives us the it focuses on the susceptibility contrast. You know, again, submillimeter in plane resolution, it pull out a lot of amazing detail in the um, uh, basal ganglia as well as in the venous vas culture. You know, high resolution diffusion weighted imaging with a multi shot acquisition to get rid of the susceptibility distortions of the frontal cortex. You know, in comparison, if we take the, the MP rage and, and project it up to a, a three millimeter slice, doing a pretty good job in capturing the, the anatomical detail. Diffusion tensor imaging, 1.5 millimeter isotropic resolution with about a six, just under seven minute scan time with uh, a threefold acceleration um, in the, the slice direction and two-fold in-plane. We can process this with, uh, with MR tricks to pull out a, a track density image and get some amazing detail within the, uh, within the ponds. Um, and then working with uh, Cornell University will be the, the first installation of a, a complete system. They, uh, they took a motor task that used for surgical planning uh, from a typical subject at 3T run the same protocol with, uh, with higher spatial resolution, thanks to Christina. Um, and in, in, less than half the in less than half the acquisition time, we're getting much better localization and uh, much sh sh sharper acquisition. Uh, so, so where are we going with 7T? Well, uh, we need more and better RF coils. We need better and more consistent guidance on implants. We have to be able to deal with motion as we push the uh, spatial resolution uh, you know, down below a millimeter. The range of motions that we're susceptible to is, is much, much greater. We need to be a lot smarter about the data we acquire. We do, there's a lot of redundancy in the, the data we collect, and I think we can, we can use that much more effectively. And then lastly, if we really want to see this grow, we have to break the cost curve. And it's not entirely clear how we're going to do that, but uh, you know, maybe with projects like this, we can begin to see a way to move forward. So thanks to a lot of people, uh, you know, Hans, Larry, and Bruce. Uh, the team from Siemens, Franz, Andreas, and Ralph Loeffler helped out with, uh, uh, you know, with getting the system up and running. You know, Al Brandenstein who passed away earlier this year for providing the funding. Uh, the team at, uh, at, Magnet, at Magnex and various inc incarnations of the company afterwards developed the magnets. Uh, yeah, the team from the Global Research Center, who are continuing to pursue this work. Uh, you know, Alan, Jeff, and Helmut from the NIH. A uh, large crew of people at UCSF and uh, my, well, my colleagues at GE, and also Emily and Nathan for sharing me with, uh, with all of us.